Welcome to To The Point. After more than a year of almost weekly newsworthy developments on one front or the other, to say that this was a very busy political week in Michigan seems redundant. Still, with a visit by the President of the United States to talk about a major event for the American auto industry, and with the governor announcing the most dramatic changes in COVID restrictions to date, this was a very busy week indeed. We began with Governor Whitmer fundamentally changing her back to normal plan. We were there in Midland as she rolled out the new guidelines. Today I am going to provide an update on masks and then we will walk through some of the changes to the back to normal plan about building back our economy. To date, Michigan has administered almost 7.9 million doses of the safe, effective COVID-19 vaccines to more than 4.6 million Michiganders ages 16 and up, with 57% of our population, eligible population receiving at least one dose. Cases and test positivity have declined for five straight weeks. Hospitalizations have declined for three weeks in a row, and our COVID metrics are trending downward in Michigan and of course across the country. This is great news. Over 60% of American adults have gotten their first shots, and almost half are fully vaccinated nationwide. So life is getting back to normal. Last Thursday, the CDC released new guidance on masks based on the strength of vaccines in preventing infection and spread among vaccinated people. Now, the guidance stated that vaccinated people no longer need to wear masks or socially distance outdoors or indoors, other than in certain medical spaces. We have adjusted our mask policy to match the CDC recommendation. So now, in Michigan, fully vaccinated people no longer need to wear a mask, outdoors or indoors, unless required by their work or business. And our recovery continues to pick up steam. Michigan's unemployment rate is now 4.9%. That's over a full point below the national average. In the past year, unemployment in Michigan has fallen by nearly 80%, and we have added 968,000 jobs over the last year. But we still have work to do. We are still short of where we were before the pandemic, and our economic recovery is going well, but we need to do and continue to do a lot more to invest in our families, small businesses, and communities to help them succeed. So, as with every decision that we've made throughout the pandemic, we are leading with science and data to keep you and your family safe. But the way to put this pandemic behind us is for everyone to get their shot. The vaccine is the best way to keep you and your family and the most vulnerable among us safe from COVID-19. Recently, the Pfizer vaccine, manufactured right here in Michigan, was authorized for children ages 12 to 16. Tens of thousands of kids have already gotten their shot to protect themselves from COVID and its variants. And I encourage all parents with kids in that age range to speak to your doctors about this vaccine. While millions of Michiganders have already gotten vaccinated, I know that many people still have questions and I, and or some just want to wait it out. I want to speak to those people and answer some of their questions. First, these vaccines are safe. Over 160 million Americans have taken it. It's been rigorously, rigorously tested and is trusted by doctors. Like other vaccines before it for polio and smallpox, the vaccine represents hope and healing. And even if you've had COVID, you should still get vaccinated to protect yourself from variants and repeat infection. If you received a monoclonal antibody treatment, you should still get your shot, but you need to wait 90 days after the treatment. And if you want to know more, I encourage you to speak with your family doctor and learn how vaccines can save your life and the lives of the people you love. Now, let's talk about some changes to the Back to Normal plan. As you can probably imagine, when the CDC came out last week with new mask guidance, we had to go back to the drawing board. Come on, that's kind of funny. You're not paying attention. All right, we went back to the drawing board. Originally, our plan had four steps, each of which was tied to a percentage of Michiganders receiving their first shot plus two weeks. 
So the first step started at 55%, and we hit that number pretty quickly. That means that um, we take the step on next Monday of getting people back in workplaces. The following steps would have happened every 5% as our vaccinations grew. On May 10th, when we surpassed that 55%, we now will see MIOSHA take action to allow offices across Michigan to allow in-person work in workplaces. Next Monday, we'll have a lot more detail to share on the MIOSHA rules for COVID-19 workplace safety. Now, based on the new mass guidance, we have two steps to get back to normal. On June 1st, all right, June 1st, all outdoor capacity limits will be lifted, including here at the Dow Diamond, so you can come and cheer on the loons. We will maintain, all right, the Dow Diamond folks are really excited, and I am too. We will maintain our mask rule, as already announced, but otherwise lift all mitigation measures on outdoor gatherings and only retain a 50% capacity limit on indoor establishments. That means that an indoor social gathering, like a wedding or a funeral or a conference or a graduation party, will be allowed to resume at 50% capacity through the month of June. In June, people who are not yet fully vaccinated are required to continue to mask up when they are indoors. MDHHS will officially release the updated order on Monday, so you can check it out then. On July 1, that is when we will take our final step. We will lift the broad mask and gatherings order and will no longer impose broad mitigation measures during the pandemic unless, of course, unanticipated circumstances arise. We do not expect that to happen. We look at this as the last moment of these, these types of orders. We will be able to sing at church, dance at weddings, cheer at games, hug each other, and laugh together. I know that that is welcome news to so many. We have one more, I'm sorry, we may have one or more targeted orders in, in place to protect vulnerable populations, but for the most part, life will be back to normal and we can have the kind of independence day we're all looking forward to after a year of living with covid and with masks and distancing and hand washing i know how jarring any change to our daily lives feel in this time of transition i'm asking that people extend one another a little bit of grace as we return to normal we should remember that tough times don't last but tough people do we've gotten through this pandemic because of each other because of our fellow Michiganders. As daily routines start to look more normal, we should recognize that everyone processes change at different speeds and in different ways. And so for the next few weeks and possibly months, some Michiganders will feel safer with a mask, even if they've been vaccinated, and that's okay. Other Michiganders who may have been vaccinated are ready to go mask-free, and that's okay too. Either way, there should be no shaming or guilt tripping Instead, I encourage people to have a conversation with their family doctor about the safe, effective vaccines. Ask your questions and learn more about how incredible they are and how they can help us get back to normal. So personally, since I am two weeks past my second dose, I'm going mask-free because I know it's safe for my family and for me and those around me. We should trust one another to make choices that are best for us. On July 1st, the broad mask rule will be lifted. But I want to be clear about the fact that businesses and workplaces are well within their rights to require masks as patrons go in. So let's give them the, our support as they navigate what's best for them and their workforce and their, their patrons. There will ultimately come a day when masks will be distant memories, maybe in boxes in our basements. But until then, we've got to transition back to normalcy together and give each other some grace. After her speech, I asked the governor what changed the timeline from being dependent on percentages of vaccines to two dates in the very near future. Britt, go ahead. J just a few weeks ago, all of the metrics were tied to percentage of people getting vaccinated. Today, they're tied to dates on a calendar. I appreciate the CDC change, but did the science change elsewhere that made you make that consideration? I mean, the CDC change was based on their most recent understanding of the science. And so when they promulgated that, 
It wasn't just confusing for Michiganders. I've talked to enough of my colleagues across the country on both sides of the aisle, and everyone had to move quickly to give some clarity and to make the state rules um, sing with, you know, sing on the same page with the, with the CDC guidelines. That's precisely what we're doing. Now, the CDC has driven a lot of our policies over the course of the last year and a half. They are the ones who are conversant in all of the studies. Certainly, Dr. Caldoun and our incredible experts here in Michigan have been a part of that conversation as well. But we've, we've been following the CDC in large part. Um, when they came up with this new policy recommendation, we wanted to make sure that the people of Michigan had clarity. But to be certain, the best way to stay safe is to be vaccinated, and that it continues to be the case. Earlier in the week, President Biden drove the all-new electric Ford F-150 Lightning in Dearborn and talked about the electric future of the American automobile industry. The future of the auto industry is electric. There's no turning back. And as Rory says, the American auto industry is at a crossroads. And the real question is whether we'll lead or we'll fall behind in the race of the future or whether we'll build these vehicles and the batteries that go in them here in the United States to rely on other countries, or whether the jobs to build these vehicles and batteries are good-paying union jobs with benefits, jobs that will sustain and grow the middle class. Right now, China is leading in this race. Make no bones about it. It's a fact. You know, we used to invest more in research and development than any country in the world. And China was number eight, or excuse me, number nine. We now are number eight, and China's number one. Can't let that be sustained. The future is going to be determined by the best minds in the world, by those who break through new barriers. You know, it has China the largest, fastest growing electric vehicle market in the world. And a key part of an electric vehicle is the battery. Right now, 80% of the manufacturing capacity of those batteries is done in China. So not the battery <clears throat> for the 150, F-150. We went down to Georgia and took care of that. It allows them to corner the market on the supplies of raw materials for those batteries. Important, almost, importing almost all the lithium, 90 percent, that comes from countries from like Australia, which lead the world in mining these kinds of critical materials. And here's the deal. It's not that China's battery technology is that much more innovative than everything else's. Remember our national labs in the United States, our universities, our automakers led in the development of this technology. But today, China has a bigger manufacturing scale than all other countries. And they're using that scale to make these batteries not just in China, but they're making them in Germany and in Mexico. And they're now exporting those electric vehicles around the world with sites on the American market. And they think they're going to win. But I got news for them. They will not win this race. We can't let them. We have to move fast. And that's what you're doing here. When President Obama and I, when Barack and I were in office, that was what we we're going to do. Remember 2009? The auto industry was flat on its back. And remember, I got criticized by the press because I was the auto guy pushing. Well, guess what? We were told that we'd never be able to sell American-made cars at the same rate as before. But we didn't listen. We bet on you, the American auto worker. We extended the lifeline, and we stepped up, saved more than a million jobs. Working in the auto industry, we set fuel efficiency standards, provided incentives for folks to buy fuel efficient vehicles. And through the Recovery Act, we made the largest investment in clean energy and battery technology ever. And the big three emerged from the crisis in a position to sell millions of vehicles made right here in the USA. But I also wanted to put the world on notice. America is back. America is back. And the competition, 
for the 21st century. The future will be built right here in America. Look at this plan. We're moving, we're working again, we're dreaming again, we're discovering again, we're leading the world again. We have shown each other in the world that there's no quit in America. There's simply no quit in America. And that's never, ever. It's every time I have these sometimes knock down, drag them out with heads of state in private, they'll say something. I say, look, it's never been a good bet to bet against America. Never, never, never. This is the United States of America. There's not a single thing. And I believe there's every fiber of our brain, not a single thing, nothing beyond our capacity when we act together. And that's exactly what we're about to do. When we come back, learning another language to graduate may take on a whole new meaning. That's next, To The Point. Welcome back to To The Point. The State House has passed a bill by Representative Greg Van Workum that could change the requirements for graduation in the state in an interesting way. Representative, it is a busy time in Lansing. There's a lot going on. We're going to talk about the budget in just a little bit. But in addition to everything else that's going on, you got a piece of legislation passed this week that would change some of the requirements for high school graduation in, I think, a very interesting way. So before I describe it and mess it up, why don't you <laughs> explain to me what uh, the purpose of this bill was and why you could exchange a foreign language for a computer language. Sure, so the bill you're referring to is we're adding some flexibility to the merit curriculum that would allow coding uh, to be used as a, a one of your language arts classes. Um, we have in the curriculum right now that you need a non-English language program. So um, actually I got this idea from a Grand Rapids Econ Club uh, meeting a couple of years ago and the importance of coding and how that just helps with the brain development, not let alone the need that is out there, uh, particularly in Michigan and in West Michigan with the type of careers that are out there right now. Um, certainly proponent of uh, foreign language requirements as well. This just allows kids and parents to have another choice of what they want to study um, with their individual learning plan. So we thought it was an interesting way to do it and we're excited that the house passed it and we'd like to see this implemented in schools. It's interesting from a couple of standpoints because while you talk about coding and first of all, the need, but also the benefits that students get from it, that's all there. But it reminds me too that the conversation around education, particularly for high school students, has increasingly gone to try to find things that are available in the real life setting. In other words, educate <clears throat> students for something that they can really transfer then into that next step. Maybe it's a trade school, um, maybe it's a vocation, maybe uh, it's a junior college, but uh, this seems like one of those things that would be more hands-on and kind of real world ready uh, when they graduate. Is that, is that part of the thought behind it as well? Certainly. Um, I come from a liberal arts background uh, myself, so I understand the full gamut of trying to be well-rounded. And uh, I think this certainly allows that as well, that you get to learn um, uh, you know, a teacher can take it in, in different directions if they want to have a cultural aspect to it as well. But this is one where some students just do not ex excel at uh, a foreign language, but may excel at this type of language and help that career or spark that interest in the career. There's been so many stories of students that have struggled either with a foreign language or just in school and then they learn about coding. Uh, they join the first robotics team. And when they once struggled at school, now they're getting full rides at colleges uh, because something kind of clicked with them. So it, again, it's, it's providing that flexibility. Some students, um, maybe not the four-year education is where they're going or want to do the associate's degree or the technical or start work right out of college. I think this gives one of those options that they can have an applicable skill uh, from the onset uh, with, with uh, classes like this. 
Have you uh, had conversations with educators uh, or administrators? Is this something that you've gotten feedback from uh, the public schools on? When we first introduced it two years ago, uh, I had our uh, head of the CTC, our career technical, um, career technical center up here and testify about it. And he brought in a bunch of student letters as well. So we've always seen it at the, the career tech centers, uh, as you mentioned before. Uh, this is a, also an opportunity to get it in uh, the everyday classroom as well. So there is some support out there uh, from teachers that recognize it. But again, it's mostly about the kids and giving kids the option uh, and parents understanding how their children learn um, so that they have another direction or another path that they want to take. We're going to change paths for a moment and talk about the budget. This is the time of year when the House and the Senate take the recommendations of the governor that she delivered earlier in the year. They come up with their priorities. Last week, you and your colleagues did that, including some of the budgets that you're in charge of. Tell me a little bit about the process, and then we'll talk about the prospects as we go down uh, the line. But right now, where are we? House has passed everything. Senate's passed everything. Try, time for some reconciliation, right? That's that's absolutely correct. Uh, the House passed their bills last week, and these are the bills that would fund the government starting October 1st. Uh, the Senate also passed theirs last week and sent theirs to the House. We're going to vote on theirs, but it's more of a procedural issue here um, as we kind of sub out their bills and then we begin those negotiations. Uh, in the coming weeks here. Um, there was legislation that I actually passed uh, last term that requires the legislature to submit budgets to the governor by July 1st. So I'm hopeful that we will keep, keep that commitment as that was one of the bills that I passed, which I thought was a good governance bill because there are a lot of budgets um, that start before that October 1st uh, date that you need to know what your budget is going to be uh, for say like a school year or something like that. So um, we're fully in the thick of it right now uh, and trying to reconcile those budgets. Well, some of those budgets you talk about start July 1st, and that's what you're talking about, getting this to at least the governor by then. Uh, so you have a, a fighting chance of knowing what may be in your budget instead of waiting till all the way in October. And we certainly have seen that happen uh, in the past. But I want to ask you a question about that legislation because the July 1st date doesn't necessarily mandate that you had those budgets to the governor, does it? I mean, it's this is not something that everybody's going to get a time out if, if the budgets aren't on the governor's desk by right. July 1st. So the legislation, yes, that we need to put it on the budget on the governor's desk by July 1st. Um, certainly that didn't happen last year because of COVID, um, that a lot of things were changed. So there is an ability to, to waive that, but I think it is a general practice or a general goal to make that happen. Um, the budgets would still begin October 1st, but as I said before, schools are making those decisions before that October 1st date. So you wanna give them the leeway uh, to make some of those decisions and hiring and stuff like that. So they've got a determination. It doesn't mean that they're signed on July 1st. Um, there'll still be some negotiations potentially with the governor on those uh, if she has some disagreements. A final note about the budget when we come back to the point. Late this past week, the legislature and governor announced an agreement to do away with some of the COVID rules in Myosha's handbook and fully negotiate a budget even let the legislature have some say in future COVID rules, if any. That's a big change, and next week we'll be talking with some of the major players in what could be a very different approach to governance in Lansing, and just how long this newfound spirit of cooperation might last. We'll see you next time. To the point.